if we can get started, um, welcome. Um, I'm uh, Tom Griffith, and I have the pleasure of moderating uh, uh, this panel, Making Men Moral and Constitutional Interpretation. Um, I'm going to give uh, brief introductions to our panelists, and then uh, turn it over to, to them. Uh, on my far right is uh, Joelle Alicia, who is an associate professor of law at Catholic University, uh, Columbus School of Law, and the co-director of the law school's project on constitutional originalism and the Catholic intellectual tradition. Joelle previously served as a law clerk for Justice uh, Samuel Alito and for Judge uh, Dermot O'Scanlan. Um, next to uh, Joel is uh, Professor uh, Mark DeGiuria Alam. I, I always get your name. That's okay. Right. Emphasize the I, raw. I, I, I always get it wrong. A raw like a roaring lion. Real lobby. He's the Kerry <laughs> Fields Professor of Law and the co-director of the Center for Law and Religion at St. John's University School of Law. His publications include The Tragedy of Religious Freedom, great title by Harvard University Press. And he's working on a book now on the role of tradition in constitutional law that will be published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, and, and finally, uh, to my immediate right is Professor uh, Stephen Smith, who's the Warren Distinguished Professor of Law and the co-executive director at the Institute for Law and Religion uh, at the University of San Diego School of Law. Uh, before moving to San Diego, Professor Smith was the Robert and Marion Short Professor at Notre Dame Law School and the Byron White Professor of Law at the University of Colorado. But most importantly, he is a distinguished alumnus of Brigham Young University. Not that I have any <laughs> bias in that regard. but uh, So uh, we'll start with, uh, with uh, Joelle. Take it away and see. Let's get... What does this book have to do with yeah. constitutional interpretation? That's my, that's my question. Thank you, Judge. Uh, well, let me begin by uh, saying, echoing some of what was said in the previous panel where we had three of Robbie's students up here. I, as a former student of Robbie's, will uh, echo much, many of their own sentiments. Like, like Sharif said, uh, other than my parents and, uh, and my Lord, there's no one who's had more of an influence on my life than, than Robbie uh, both in shaping me intellectually and personally, and I owe so much to him. So it's been a real privilege for me to have the opportunity to help organize this conference and to be on this panel uh, as a tribute to his book and his work. Uh, let me start with the question the judge just asked. He asked, what does Making Men Moral, this book, have to do with constitutional interpretation? I'll modify that a little bit and say constitutional theory, uh, because Making Men Moral is a book about political morality and about uh, arguments like the anti-perfectionist arguments of John Rawls. And constitutional theory is concerned with things like the scope of Congress's power under the Commerce Clause. So what do these two things have to do with each other? Uh, but that puzzle, I think, dissolves when you think about what constitutional theories are, normative constitutional theories at least, are theories that propose methodologies for adjudicating constitutional disputes they say that judges ought to adjudicate disputes in a certain way, according to certain methodologies. And that ought requires some sort of moral argument, some argument for why judges should adjudicate cases in a certain way, or at least that it is morally permissible to adjudicate cases in a certain way. And because that kind of argument is about the judicial role, the judicial power of political community, it is fundamentally a, an argument of political morality. Uh, to determine what constitutional theory to adopt. And so constitutional theory ultimately does rest on precisely the kinds of uh, questions of political morality that the book Making Men Moral addresses. And so it shouldn't surprise us, actually, that questions of political mor morality like those addressed in the book find analogs in constitutional theory. And I would say specifically that John Rawls has had a tremendous influence on American constitutional theory scholarship uh, and so to the extent that Ravi succeeds in his book in uh, showing the problems with Rawls's thought, that would suggest that similar problems might infect American constitutional theory. So what I'm going to say today is first that, uh, is for, what I'm going to do first is just sketch out Rawls's project and Ravi's critique of Rawls's project in Making Men Moral. And I'll do that briefly, but I, I do think it's important to recap it uh, because a lot of the people who will be watching this panel in particular probably are not as deep in the weeds on Rawls as uh, the people who were watching previous panels, so I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. Uh, and then I'll talk about how Rawls has had a real influence on American constitutional theory, 
and how some of the same critiques that Robbie makes of roles in, uh, in, the, in the book translate over to constitutional theory and show that there are problems with some American constitutional theories that are based on Rawls. And finally, I'll conclude with, uh, like Sharif, uh, a, a gentle critique of uh, the book uh, in, in the spirit of uh, Robbie asking us to always interrogate uh, these ideas. So I'll start with uh, Rawls, his project, Robbie's critique of Rawls's project in the book. So Rawls is seeking to identify and justify principles of justice that can serve as uh, the uh, terms of association in society. And those principles of justice he identifies and attempts to justify through his famous original position, where the participants in the original position are stripped of their conceptions of the good, of their demographics. They don't know whether they're rich or poor or their religious views um, uh, or you know, sex or, or race or anything like that. Uh, and behind that veil of ignorance, the participants in the original position choose the principles of justice. Now, immediately, it should become apparent two related features of the original position. One is that by stripping them of their conception of the good, these participants in the original position uh, are not making decisions in choosing the principles of justice based on the truth or falsity of those principles. If they have no conceptions of the good, then they can't really do that, right? Uh, Rather, and this is the related point, they're choosing the principles of justice based on something like risk aversion, that uh, insofar as they emerge out of the, the original position, they would be comfortable living under the principles they've chosen, you know, no matter what ends up being the case about them when they emerge out of it. Now, I'll just quickly say that's an oversimplified version because th- that is the initial choice of the principles of justice, and then there is a more complicated process that occurs after that. But that is at least the, the beginning of the process of choosing the principles of justice. So Robbie, uh, in Making Men Moral Critiques, the original position uh, on multiple grounds, but his two main ones uh, in that chapter are that, first of all, uh, choosing the principles of justice based on this sort of risk aversion doesn't accord with practical reasonableness. And I just have a couple of quotes here from the book where he says, rational people in the real world care about their beliefs not because their beliefs are theirs, but rather because their beliefs are, they suppose, true. Yet, behind the veil of ignorance, I am self-interested in the radical sense of being concerned not with beliefs qua true or ends qua worthy, but with beliefs and ends qua mine. That is, I think that's an accurate critique, uh, an accurate description and therefore a strong critique of the original position, again, at least as the, as the principles are initially chosen in that original position, uh, in that you are relying on a, uh, a, an, a sub-rational kind of self-interest and risk aversion in choosing the principles of justice in the original position, since you're not, you don't have access to a conception of the good. It's not a form of moral deliberation in that sense. Uh, and as Robbie says, that, that means that you're, you are uh, choosing, you are acting for reasons that practical reasonableness wouldn't accept. You're acting basically just on desires and on wants. I, 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 want, I, I want to make sure that when I emerge out of the original position, the things that I would want to have, the desires I would have, whether they're good or not, because I'm not evaluating those in this context, uh, would be uninhibited uh, coming out of the original position, right? And that, that is not to act based on reasons, good or bad, but based on wants and desires. Now, Robbie then makes the second point, the related point of, well, what if, uh, what, if what Rawls is really doing is implicitly rejecting the need to... Uh, to meet the demands of practical reasonableness? What if instead what he's doing is saying, well, we don't have to act based on reasons that practical reasonableness would uh, accept. We should act based on desires or wants. That is actually what we should uh, motivate human action based off of. Uh, And Robbie points out, well, that is a view of the human person. That is a view of how uh, we should or are are kind of programmed to act. It's just based on desires and wants uh, and not based on reasons. But that's a controversial anthropology, right? That's a controversial view. And if the whole purpose of the original position and this whole construct was to not act based on controversial views of the human person and uh, and, and, uh, conceptions of the good, then you can't smuggle that in as the basis for justifying these principles through the original position. 
And I think that is a particularly devastating critique of of Rawls's project because the whole purpose is to avoid relying on those controversial conceptions in the formulation of the original position, and yet it must do so. Otherwise, it's impossible to explain how you are choosing these principles without a conception of the good. So that's the critique of uh, of Rawls in in the book. And despite those critiques, which I find very powerful, um, the Rawls's conception of justice has had a huge influence on American constitutional theory. I think especially on what Richard Fallon calls practice-based constitutional theories. These are theories that generally argue that we should conform our methods of constitutional adjudication to our social practices, that to the extent we have deeply embedded social practices, uh, we should have a constitutional theory that is consistent with those social practices. If you are inconsistent with those deeply embedded social practices, that makes your constitutional theory less persuasive to the same extent that it's inconsistent with them. So one example of uh, the kind of argument that you see all the time from practice-based constitutional theorists is what's called the canonical case argument. This is where you identify some Supreme Court precedent that's deeply embedded in our social practices, just well accepted, and you show how some rival constitutional theory wouldn't lead to that result in that constitutional case, and you say that is, if not a sufficient, then a very powerful ground for rejecting the, con- that, the constitutional theory because it can't explain this deeply embedded social practice of this case, this canonical case. Uh, so that's, that's what practice-based constitutional theories uh, do. They, they, they try to reconcile their theories with our social practices, and they take as their inspiration a lot of what Rawls said in both A Theory of Justice and in his later book, Political Liberalism, which came out the same year as Making Men Moral. I'm going to focus for now on um, an argument that's uh, a theory that's sketched by David Strauss from the University of Chicago. His theory is called Common Law Constitutional Interpretation, so it treats constitutional interpretation as uh, an, an evolving practice in the way that common law reasoning would be, pre- precedent-based reasoning. So this is a non-originalist theory of constitutional adjudication. And what's his justification for common law constitutionalism? It's very Rawlsian, and he's very explicit about this, Strauss. He says uh, that we need to deal with the fact of reasonable pluralism in our society, uh, and we need to have an over- overlapping consensus to deal with that fact of reasonable pluralism. So this is coming based mostly off of Rawls's work in political liberalism as opposed to a theory of justice, but I'm going to say that Robbie's critiques of Rawls in, uh, and, and the theory of justice carry through on this side of the house as well. Uh, so in, uh, in political liberalism, Rawls says, well, we've got this fact of reasonable pluralism, people with different comprehensive doctrines, different views of the good, And when you have these different views of the good that arise inevitably in a free society, it's going to be very difficult to ensure that principles of justice are freely obeyed uh, despite these divergent viewpoints on the good. So what we need is an overlapping consensus. What we need is principles of justice that can serve as the locus of each person from within their own reasonable, comprehensive doctrines agreeing on those principles of justice. Justice. So a Kantian and a Thomas can both agree on these principles of justice as long as they're reasonable in approaching this. Uh, Strauss very similarly says, well, we've got the fact of reasonable pluralism in our society. We don't have an agreed upon conception of the good. So we need to take our social practices about law, so specific canonical cases or the text of the Constitution, and we need to keep those set as points of overlapping consensus in our culture, and then reason from those points of consensus out towards places where we disagree in adjudicating constitutional disputes. But notice there that what Strauss has done is is that he has substituted for the principles of justice our social practices as the object of the overlapping consensus, and then takes those as set and moves forward from there. I think that this creates for Rawls a very similar, uh, for Strauss a very similar problem that Robbie identifies for Rawls, in that just because they are our social practices doesn't mean they are good social practices. Just because we choose the principles in the original position doesn't mean they are good principles uh, without, if they're divorced from any evaluative conception of the good. So we might have a social practice, and we arguably did in the early 20th century. Scholars disagree about this, but uh, in the early 20th century, we might very well have viewed Plessy versus Ferguson as deeply embedded in our social practices. And yet I think we would all agree that that would be a deeply unjust social practice and therefore should be overthrown, quite apart from whether it's deeply embedded or not. 
So to take that as the point of overlapping consensus and move from there creates all sorts of problems. Now, instead, you might say, well, what Strauss is really doing is relying on some sort of idea of stability as a normative value that overcomes potential justices or injustices of, of particular social practices. And that's why he can make a general claim of let's start with overlapping consensus on social practices. But, and here again, we have an, an analogy to what Robbie said about Rawls, that is itself a very controversial normative claim that stability considerations always or usually should overcome the justice or injustice of any particular social practice, and therefore we should adhere to the social practices. But the whole point of Strauss's theory is to not have to rely on controversial conceptions of the good and controversial normative claims. So it seems to me that Strauss, in relying on uh, Rawls, has found himself in a very similar situation as the person he's relying on and subject to some of the same critiques that Robbie makes of Rawls. I'm going over time, so I'll just very quickly wrap up by, by saying what's the kind of gentle critique here of, of the book. I think that uh, Robbie's book dispositively shows that Rawls's answers to his own questions are incorrect. But Rawls's question about how do we adduce principles of justice in a society marked by reasonable pluralism uh, is a deep question of political philosophy and a very challenging one that the book, Making Men Moral, does not address at any great length. Uh, Robbie does address that, that argument, that issue, very briefly in an essay at the end of In Defense of Natural Law. But as a general matter, I think natural law theorists have not paid sufficient attention to answering this question about once we get the, the moral points and, the, and, and the, the normative questions right, how do we then implement that in a society marked by reasonable pluralism? Uh, and that is something that I think natural law theorists really should devote more attention to moving forward. Thank you. So I, I, I'm, I'm watching Professor George's body language, and I, I think he was ready to respond, but you can do that later. <laughs> okay, here you go. Yeah, later. Professor. Sure. Uh, thanks, Judge. Um, so I'm, uh, like everyone else, very honored uh, to take part in this greatly distinguished panel and this conference chock full of uh, luminaries and deep thinkers to remember and celebrate uh, Professor George's book. Making Men Moral was one of really three books together with Alistair McIntyre's After Virtue, which is quoted right at the beginning of the book, and John Finnis's Natural Law and Natural Rights, authored by, as we've, as we've heard, uh, Robbie's own teacher, uh, that first induced me in the late 1990s uh, to think about being uh, an academic. And here I just want to drop a footnote. You know, it's an advantage of, of going last on in conferences like these that you hear kind of interesting things throughout the course of the, of the two days when everybody else is, and you kind of rapidly jot them down to try to stuff them into your own uh, paper. And I want to drop a little footnote. This was a point made actually yesterday uh, to me by my friend Michael Moreland. Um, a question was asked yesterday about whether anybody has replaced John Rawls as the central figure, the uh, colossus, I believe it was put, that bestrode the narrow world of secular political philosophy. Um, so Finnis, McIntyre, and perhaps we might add Charles Taylor, Hadley Arcus, and of course a generation later, Robert George, um, perhaps a few others. Who will come after that mighty assembly to constitute the authority, the authority, in Catholic political philosophy. Uh, of course, there have been important works, but do we face the same fractures and crises of authority that they do, that the other side does? I think that's an important question also uh, for us to have in mind. But at any rate, back to the book, the challenges of making men moral to what was then the dominant, and so I thought the inadequate way, I still think, of thinking about matters political and legal were a revelation to me. Um, and I would say just one other thing by way of introduction. Um, many years later, I would come to know Robbie in person, uh, and I have been greatly graced by his friendship, his support, and the great network of intellectual fellowship that he has constructed. Um, but like my friend Elizabeth Kirk, uh, um, and unlike some of my friends and colleagues here who were lucky enough to be Robbie's students, I first got to know Robbie through his writing, through his mind, and through his ideas. 
Uh, and so for someone rightly known and celebrated for such keen and magnetic personal powers, for someone with such immense force of character and personality, it's perhaps notable that in my case, I came to know those qualities much later in my own life after many encounters with his writing. Uh, after all these years, I still return to making men moral, as I did recently in teaching a course made possible by Robbie at Princeton on the freedom of speech and the freedom of inquiry. And I'm gratified that one of my star students in that class, Matthew Wilson, is also here. And so the tradition is passed along. Um, I'd like in, in my remaining time to talk about a feature of Making Men Moral that particularly affected me when I first read it and that has influenced my own thought in writing about constitutional theory and that I think is perhaps one of the central contributions of the book. And I'm going to claim that this particular insight did not remain as prominent in Robbie's subsequent work on constitutional theory as it had been in the book. It kind of dropped out. And I think that is a matter of regret because this insight goes, in my view, to the heart of some of the troubles that American politics and law, including constitutional law, is now suffering. What is that feature and that insight? I'm going to call it the settle down principle. Um, in chapter one, Robbie discusses Aristotle's view that inasmuch as people are moved by passion rather than reason, quote, what is needed to prepare them for virtue is not argument, but coercion, close quote. And then he goes on to say that in light of the passionate motives, emotional motives that induce many people to act, what we need from the law is, quote, to settle people down if it is to help them to gain some appreciation for the good, close quote. Another way to say this, and here I will actually pick up a, a thread of, uh, uh, from Ian Rowe's presentation yesterday, um, is that the law has to pay attention to the character-forming side of things. It's got to combat bad emotion, not with reason, but with good emotion. Because in a world where people are not ready to reason together, where they have not been systematically trained and cultivated to do so over long periods of time, perhaps in Robbie's seminars, where their dispositions are simply unprepared for that kind of exchange, then the powers of reason are, if not utterly ineffectual in moving people to the good, then at least weak and premature. And we need that character-forming side first, and we need it good and hard. In my own estimation, this problem identified right at the beginning of the book, the problem of the increasingly stark absence of common political and ethical character is perhaps the central problem of American civic life. It is also, as I'll discuss in a moment, a crucial but virtually ignored problem of constitutional theory and constitutional law. It is the problem of what C.S. Lewis described as the underdevelopment of the chest without which any development in the head is nearly useless. It is the problem of the undercultivation of the right kinds of feelings, emotions, loyalties, dispositional responses, the problem of what Lewis called the irrigation of deserts in the young. The chief defense against bad emotions is the inculcation of good emotions, or as Cardinal Newman once put it, quote, philosophy, however enlightened, however profound, gives no command over the passions, no influential motives, no vivifying principles. Quarry the granite rock with razors or moor the vessel with a thread of silk. Then may you hope with such keen and delicate instruments as human knowledge and human reason to contend against those giants, the passion and the pride of man, close quote. Or here again is Lewis, quote, for famished nature will be avenged, and a hard heart is no infallible protection against a soft head, close quote. And here I would add, or even perhaps against a hard head. In later works on constitutional theory, Robbie has consistently emphasized the rationality, the reasonableness, the logical cogency 
of the natural law position on issues ranging from abortion to assisted suicide to matters of sexual ethics to matters of the true nature of civil uh, and constitutional rights and more in books such as The Excellent Clash of Orthodoxies. He has devoted his writing and thinking life to demonstrating the rational superiority of the views he has consistently championed over the secular and progressive alternatives that dominated the intellectual and popular byways then as now. Clash of Orthodoxies does this with Robbie's usual perspicacity and clarity of moral vision. But what it does less, and what some of Robbie's other writing in this area also does less, is to pick up and run with that early thread of making men moral, the problem of emotion and character and how to use the law to form people the right way so that they are receptive to arguments of the sort that appear in Clash of Orthodoxies and elsewhere. I might add here that another of Robbie's exceptional students, my co-panelist, Joel, has done what I consider to be exceptionally fine work on the question of the role of emotion in constitutional theory in an article in the Notre Dame Law Review, uh, which I, I highly commend to you. Um, but this problem, the problem of the formation of the constitutional chest, um, has been, with honorable exceptions, determinedly ignored by constitutional theorists. We will tell you all about the separation of powers and federalism, and the scope of free speech and religious exercise. We will go on and on about the meaning of and the danger in establishments of religion. Give us a textual inch, and we will take on, or take an arid linguistic originalist mile. Uh, but ask us about what lies at the heart of our political establishment. Inquire with us about the we in we the people, and what binds the polity in fraternal affection, and we will retreat with some embarrassment, silent and cold. This is a problem. This is a big, big problem in my view. Given the steady decay of the chest that we see everywhere around us, see, for example, the recent popular vote in Ohio, See the vote taken in the comments by Carter Sneed earlier in Montana. See also the barbarism we see around us uh, 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 concerning even worse barbarisms around the world, but hardly only all of these matters. Might we not need to reflect more and more deeply and more intensely on that critical insight that Robbie had some 30 years ago? And so permit me to suggest in closing that the closing off of the religious perspective, of religious language, religious ideas, religious perspectives, in particular, I think, Christian ideas, Catholic ideas, but not only those, that these might open up and begin to irrigate what has become the desert wasteland of constitutional community. They might begin to water and cultivate the parched landscape of constitutional theory. Robbie's settle-down principle, drawn from the classical tradition, helps us to see just how and why. Thank you. Professor Smith. Well, for me, likewise, it's an honor to be here. Uh, at my stage, I actually try to take a nap every afternoon, and I, and I really resist flying across the country for academic conferences, but when I was invited to this one, I really just had to come, because Robbie's been, I think, a good friend and an influence on me for over three decades now, and I, I just think it's so important to celebrate what he has done. I also appreciated a lot of the uh, discussions earlier today. Some of them were very insightful, for me at least, and even inspiring, which is rare for an academic conference. And some of them made points that I try to will probably try to make too, but some of them made them more forcefully and articulately than I will. Um, I, uh, th this conference is about making men moral, and our panel is about constitutional interpretation. And that's a little awkward because Robbie says little or nothing about constitutional interpretation in making men moral. 
Um, so what I did was sort of consult the emanations and penumbras of making men moral, uh, um, along with some things that he said more explicitly elsewhere to try and come up with a few reflections about the relation between natural law and constitutional interpretation. Now, of course, a lot has been written about that subject already, but it's an enduring uh, question, and I do think the context has changed pretty significantly from the time that he wrote some of the uh, that, that book and some earlier things in ways that might help us to appreciate different aspects of the question. So to try to develop that thought, I think from the 1960s through the 1990s and continuing on and off up until Obergefell at least, it was widely perceived that the U.S. Supreme Court was using loose, unhistorical interpretations of the Constitution to promote a kind of a liberal agenda and a liberalism, non-perfectionist or neutrality liberalism, that basically held that government should not be taking positions on the good life, but should just simply be facilitating individuals in pursuing whatever their own conceptions of the good life were. Now, both the originalism, I think, um, of people like Robert Bork and the new natural law of scholars like John Finnis and Robbie George resisted this, Uh, liberal agenda, though in different ways. Originalism resisted it by contending that courts should limit themselves to enforcing the positive law, including the Constitution, according to its original or textual meaning. But more substantively, the new natural lawyers were criticizing the philosophy of neutrality liberalism itself. And I think making men moral was maybe the outstanding instance of this kind of criticism. I don't mean to imply, by the way, that um, either originalism or new natural law were just de- devised as strategies to resist judicial imperialism. I'm sure the people who work in these fields were uh, very much articulating positions that they believed. But it did happen that they were sort of like um, nice allies or partners in this resistance to this judicial program. And I think as a result, there was kind of a, kind of a sort of a natural brotherhood between originalism and uh, and a new natural law. And this uh, union is imperative, I think, in Robbie's work, because although making men moral itself doesn't say much about constitutional interpretation, elsewhere Robbie did specifically endorse an originalist approach to the Constitution. Um, he was at pains to um, resist the sort of simple-minded inference that if someone's a natural lawyer, then they can't also be a positivist of, of the Robert Bork sort of variety. And I think he made this point maybe most clearly in a debate that he had with uh, James Fleming that was reprinted in uh, The Clash of Orthodoxies. Um, Here, uh, Robbie um, stressed, I think, that, um, as he put it, natural law itself does not settle the question of whether it falls ultimately to the legislature or the judiciary in any particular polity to ensure that the positive law conforms to natural law and respects natural rights. And then he elaborated, if we see that natural law does not dictate an answer to the question of its own enforcement, it is clear that authority to enforce the natural law may reasonably be vested primarily or even exclusively with the legislature, or, this is important, I think, alternatively, a significant measure of such authority may be granted to the judiciary as a check on legislative power. Robbie seemed to think that our our Constitution, however, had done the former, taken the former alternative. He says, just as black... Bork, Scalia, and other textualists and originalists are nearer the mark in my judgment and calling for judicial restraint in the absence of a clear constitutional warrant for overturning duly enacted legislation. That's because the Constitution, as I read the document, places primary authority for giving effect to natural law and protecting natural rights to the institutions of democratic self-government. And as one application of that point, he said something that relevant today, certainly. While I think that pro-abortion policies, whether put into place legislatively or by judicial action, are unjust to their unborn victims, I am not in the least troubled by the proposal to settle the question of abortion via the processes of representative democracy, even in states like New York, that are likely to resolve the question in what I judge to be the wrong direction. Now, um, this... um, I think brotherhood of uh, natural law and originalism was an intelligible position a quarter of a century ago when Robbie made these observations, and I think it's an intelligible position now. But it does look a little different now, given some of the changes that have occurred, and I'll briefly mention three of these, but these have all, I think, been um, mentioned already today. First, at least for now, we no longer have a Supreme Court that is bent on imposing the morality of neutrality liberalism on the nation. Second, the major threat on the left to what, in making men moral, Robbie called the central tradition, is no longer neutrality liberalism, but rather a more militant progressivism, 
And in this context, the friends of the tradition may be more inclined to defend liberalism in a different version, to be sure, than to attack it. And we've heard quite a bit about that also today, I think. And third, originalism today appears to be criticized not only from the progressive left, but also, and even more vehemently, from figures who claim to be speaking from and within the classical legal tradition. I say appears to be because it seems to me that maybe the most important text, at least within the legal academy in this movement, the book Common Good Constitutionalism, issues a series of shrill denunciations, but read closely, actually endorses most of originalism, and also has little to offer as an alternative saying only that the Constitution should be read in light of or in harmony with the natural law is not very helpful in proposing a meaningful uh, approach to constitutional interpretation. Now, given this changed context, it may be time to reassess the alliance of natural law and originalist constitutionalism. And I'm not going to attempt any overall reassessment here or anywhere else probably, but I'll just offer three quick uh, observations. First, although I think Robbie was right to say that consistently with natural law, polity could vest all authority to enforce the natural law, as he put it, in the democratic branches and processes rather than in the judiciary, it's not clear to me that our polity has in fact done that. Probably the most extensive and careful case for natural law, uh, natural law case for originalism that I've seen is in a recent article by Joel. And for myself, I find that article to be extremely impressive And yet there are points in the article that I find less than compelling. Robbie acknowledged all along that a polity could also play some responsibility for implementing the natural law in the judiciary. Maybe our polity has done that, or at least it's not foreclosed that possibility. Second, although it seems right to say that natural law would permit a polity to structure its institutions in various ways for the common good, I don't think this permission would amount to a blank check. It seems to me that institutional arrangements and decisions would still need to satisfy the demands of the natural law on an ongoing basis. So even if the Constitution prescribes an originalist approach to constitutional interpretation, that prescription wouldn't necessarily be the end of the discussion. Which leads to my third point. I've long believed that it might be helpful to distinguish more clearly than we usually do between constitutional interpretation and adjudication of constitutional cases. Originalism might be the correct way to interpret the Constitution, or in other words, to say what the Constitution or what the document means. But strictly speaking, and with a partial apology to John Marshall, a court's essential job is ultimately not to say what the Constitution means, but rather, as Marshall also said, to properly decide the cases that come before it. In that adjudication, the Constitution may be the supreme law, but even so, it's not necessarily decisive, even in cases where it applies. We can see this clearly enough, I think, in cases in which a court declines to apply a constitutional provision that could be applicable because of a statute of limitations or a waiver or an equitable doctrine like latches or unclean hands. So natural law conceivably might have a role in constitutional adjudication that goes beyond its narrower role, if any, in interpreting the Constitution itself. When I was just a fledgling academic, I published an article proposing what I call the natural law approach to constitutional adjudication under the somewhat misleading title of Why Should Courts Obey the Law? A colleague told me at the time that I would someday regret writing this article, but that hasn't happened, mostly because neither I nor anyone else, so far as I can tell, has ever read the article (laughs) since it was published. Um, But whatever the merits of the article, or lack thereof, I continue to think that inquiries along these lines might be fruitful. If common good constitutionalism could actually go beyond invective and vague slogans and actually explain in some helpful way and in usable terms how natural law could figure in constitutional adjudication, I think that would do us all a service. I don't know whether that will happen, but we can hope so. Thanks. Well, thanks thanks to each of you. And, and at some point, I'd like to get you all responding to one another's pieces, but I'm going to take the prerogative as moderator and and start first. And it's going to sound like I'm building a little bit on what Steve was saying, and so I think it's largely directed to Joel and and Mark. Here's my question. Um, It it seems to me that there are arguments for many of the arguments you were making are for what ought to be in the Constitution. How do we use... Robbie's insights, 
how do we use the natural law necessary to figure out what's in the Constitution? Right. So uh, there have to be uh, principles of political morality that uh, that you rely on to address what role a judge plays in our system. Right. It can't just be. Uh, it would just beg the question to say, well, the original meaning of the text says that the judicial role is X, therefore that is the judicial role. Well, that, that assumes that you should adhere to the original meaning of the text, and that should require some sort of moral argument that justifies originalism in the first place. And the same is true for any theory of constitutional law or, or adjudication, depending on which one you want to uh, uh, use to describe constitutional theory. Um, so the arguments that I was laying out in my initial remarks were arguments of political morality that help define how uh, we ought to think about the judicial role under our system. And so that's, both an, in, that's an interaction of both moral argumentation and uh, descriptive facts about our system of government under, under our Constitution. So the argument that I've laid out for originalism, for example, builds on natural, the natural law tradition's conception of political authority and legitimate political authority and argues that it is necessarily a harm to the common good to disregard the people's original understanding of what they were doing in the Constitution, and that that creates a moral imperative to obey the original meaning. Mm -hmm. But that original meaning then could have some contingent historical uh, uh, meaning that allows judges to have a very broad authority under our Constitution to uh, set aside positive law in light of the natural law, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's just a contingent historical question. That's not uh, a question of, of political morality as an initial matter. Uh, so I think that in response to your question, the, it's not so much that I'm arguing what the Constitution ought to say. I'm making an argument about what the judicial role ought to be, both in light of considerations of judicial, of, you know, judicial role morality and the specific features of our constitutional System, how those two things interact with each other and produce a particular constitutional theory. Okay, thanks. Mark, you want to? Yeah, uh, so, Judge, I don't have a, a fully worked out uh, view about how natural law can inform the constitu- what's in the Constitution or its meaning, but I have started to work on a view um, concerning a, it's not quite the kind of practice based, it's not at all, I think, the kind of practice based view that Joel takes on in his article, but it is a, it is a view that takes um, the endurance of our practices, our social and political and legal practices, uh, and the endurance of those practices as reflecting determinations, a la natural law, determinatio, of, um, or specifications, one could say, of various political virtues uh, as exemplifying what it is that the, let's say, broader, broader statements in the constitutional law, in, in, in the Constitution might mean. Um, that is one way, and I think a, an important one, to understand the kind of view of what I've been calling traditionalism in uh, constitutional interpretation and constitutional law uh, that, that's one way to understand the sort of normative pitch and the normative content uh, of, of traditions. But I agree, I, I certainly agree with Joel um, that uh, the connection to co- some kind of normative, moral, virtue ethical uh, justification uh, in those practices must be made. Uh, but at least that's one possibility with respect to uh, the question how the natural law might inform constitutional meaning and one that I've been trying to work on. Okay. Steve, do you want to? Yeah, check? yeah. So um, I, I think that uh, Robbie makes it pretty clear, I think, in, in Making Men Moral and elsewhere that he is trying to say that, um, well, I'll put it this way. The, the final chapter of Making Men Moral that talks about um, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association, and so forth, that Sharif talked about earlier and so forth, uh, could certainly be read as 
explaining what constitutional provisions on that kind of subject ought to mean, what we would want to have in the Constitution. But I think he makes it quite clear he's not saying, you know, that the Constitution should necessarily be interpreted to mean those things. And I think he says that elsewhere. This is where the distinction between original meaning and natural law comes in. And um, and so I think he's, I think, I don't know what he would say now, but I think he was making it pretty clear at that time that he was not trying to make, you know, that kind of close connection. And it made a lot of sense, I think, at least then, and maybe still, you know, to stress the distinction. Because, but it made more sense then, perhaps, than it even does now, because once again, as I suggested, there was a lot of reason to try to resist people who were arguing, oh, we can, we know what morality is and we should just read it right into the Constitution and let the courts enforce it. There was a good reason to try to resist that, I think. If you said now, okay, but at this moment, maybe we want to see how they would connect. Um, there are a couple obvious ways in which they might, but I don't know if he would favor either of these or whether I would either. I mean, one would just be the Ronald Dworkin type of approach, you know, read, you know, moral reading to everything in the Constitution. Adrian Vermeule really praises Dworkin throughout the book. You know, he's in favor of that sort of thing. But there are some good objections to, to that. Uh, I'm not as opposed to that as I once was, maybe. Sometimes I find myself inadvertently sliding into that. But I did one time, I think... Resist, resist. Uh, I, should, I remember describing to a colleague some 20 years ago, I said, I regard Dworkin as the embodiment of jurisprudential evil in the modern world or something like that, you know? And now, and then people say, yeah, but what you're doing is a lot like... So, so you know, I don't know, but that's one, that's one way. The other way, I think, is a little bit more... In, I, I can't speak for him, but I think Hadley is a little bit more, just use a straight moral reading to interpret terms of the Constitution. You know, if it talks about life, if it talks about liberty, if it talks about different things, don't interpret those necessarily according to what the people who enacted them thought they were enacting, interpret them according to what they really mean. And Michael Moore, another natural lawyer in a very secular vein, though not, you know, made an argument for that a long time ago. And that's another possibility. But I think there are serious objections to that as well. So in the end, I'm not completely sure that the sort of distinction that Robbie was making isn't still the best position. I'm just not sure. I think this is a time for kind of rethinking. Uh, some of those well, questions. Let me add, I hope he hasn't changed his view because in the course I teach on this, that's the article I use when we're talking about natural law, the Robbie George answer to what's a judge supposed to do with, with, with natural law. So uh, if, if I might, before you all go at each other, Mark, I'm fascinated by your use of the phrase uh, and you're pointing out that the law has a function to settle us down, the settle down function. Now, does that have content to it beyond just being rational and nice and listening to one another? Or, or, and, and beyond, that, 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 would be, that would be great if it, if it accomplished that. But is there more to it than, than that? Is, the, is, there, is, is there something we can do with that in interpreting the Constitution beyond just telling us to slow down and listen to think carefully? Um, so and I'm hoping the answer is yes. Well, but, I'm, okay, I'm, okay. I hope so too. Yeah, I, I yeah. think so. And and I let me answer it just in, in a relatively narrow um, zone, and that is the zone of constitutional theory. I, I've always thought that the choice of the adoption of const, a constitutional theory, whether one is a judge or a theorist, or um, it's not just something that we do to the Constitution. It's something that is done to us in adopting that theory. And, um, and the more that we use that theory uh, and apply it in a variety and become wedded to it, the more it affects us and, and forms our character. You know, the, there's, there's a reason that Dworkin's uh, uh, ideal was Hercules, Judge Hercules, right? I mean, that, that says something about the kind of character, the kind of, and, and everything that that Dworkin explained with respect to Judge Hercules. Um, it says something about the kind of character that Dworkin admired, that he saw himself as. And I, I wish that more theorists, um, in, in fact, I, I've always thought that there could be a kind of a typology or a sort of character types that could be developed um, along the lines of or in association with constitutional theories that would sort of explain or, or do something to show the kind of character being developed um, in judges and in theorists and others, because that matters. That the development of that character matters for the kind of constitutional republic that we're making. 
Um, and yet I think it's something that um, hasn't been properly attended to um, uh, for, for a variety of reasons that I will, that I will hold off on, on expounding on at the moment. Okay, anyone, Joel, Steve, you want to jump in? Well, uh, you don't ask, uh, are you asking us to come in on what the other people uh, what said? Said? <laughs> no, no, I'll, no, I'll let, I'll let that go. Okay, so. okay. Um, can, can I follow up with, with this point? So Yuval is working on a book called The Constitution and Unity, right? And, and I won't speak for him, but, but I, th I think there's some similarities here in that, that the Constitution requires us to develop a character that seeks for unity. And a component of that is compromise, right? Is, 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 is compromise. So, um, so are, are you saying the same thing, or are you are we so talking I, different? I, I, uh, I'm so glad that you raised Yuval's work. I've, I've, I don't know the, the new manuscript. I hope, I hope to read it. I know the, the uh, essay uh, that is sort of hinting a little bit about what the new book will be about. But yes, I think that that is exactly... Correct. I think the kind of um, the the kind of approach that you've all, and not only in this, what I don't even know is this new book, but um, the problems that you've all has been identifying over the years of fracture, of of breakdown in our constitutional republic are ones that I wish constitutional theorists uh, have had been addressing as well, and so I'm very excited and eager to see what he has to say and how that can be incorporated into and affect the, the future trajectory, the future shape of constitutional theorizing. If I could just Joel, jump yeah. in, I, I very much agree with that. Um, and you know, at the end of my remarks, I said uh, that. Um, I don't think natural law theorists have paid sufficient attention to the problems of the fact of reasonable pluralism. Um, I think that uh, on the constitutional theory side, uh, Leval's upcoming book really is directly relevant to that problem, right? It is taking seriously the problem of reasonable pluralism and trying to, uh, w and without prescinding from notions of the good or notions of what is true, which is the Rawlsian approach, uh, taking seriously that we, we want to identify what is true and what is good, and yet we have to maintain um, a, a, a constitutional regime in which we live together um, despite those disagreements. And that's just a vexing problem that uh, I don't think has been given a, enough attention. So I'm very much looking forward to the book uh, for that reason. I should also just add that within the natural law tradition, there are a lot of resources that we could draw upon to address this problem of reasonable pluralism, how ideal theory interacts with practical theory. Cicero devoted a lot of attention to exactly this problem. Aquinas in some parts of the Summa addresses the issue. Um, so I do think there are resources there. And I think given how fractious our society is at this moment, it's even more important to address it. Okay, thank you. So with that, how about each other? What, what do you want to ask of each other from the presentations that do? That you gave. I've got, I've got my, I've got some more questions, but I let, let you all take a turn asking your questions of one another. Well, I, maybe I'll start. Um, so, although neither uh, Joel nor Marx did anything I really disagreed with, I think so. I'm not sure. I, I took Joel essentially. I, I, I agree with your point. Essentially, you know uh, that Rawls was trying to, you know, solve this problem of pluralism. You're talking about right at the end by saying that since we have different ideas of the good, we should come up with a system that doesn't endorse anybody's ideas of the good, and that doesn't work for various reasons, and Robbie identified some of those reasons. And the same thing is true for lots of other, like David Strauss, yep. and, and, and in some ways you might say, that's kind of been the problem, at least since the Reformation, hasn't it been, you know? And so you might say almost everything since then has been, in, in some ways, trying to address that problem, and the sort of modern liberal strategy has been, can we do it without just making sure the government will never take any sides or take any view and say, no, we can't really, and, and we fool ourselves to the extent that we pretend that we're doing that. So that's an ongoing problem, admittedly, and I, I think you, you're right about that. Um, but I'll tell you with Mark. Um, let's see if this is true. I didn't disagree with anything that Mark said either, but I think insofar as he says, you know, there are prior questions about 
emotion and character, basically, you know, without addressing questions like that, if you started trying to reason about things, you can't really even do it unless you have, you know, the, the right kind of character and so forth. Um, that, seems, that seems right, but just two quick points. One is, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure whether you should fault constitutional theorists for not saying so much about that. I mean, you might say, you know, there are a lot of things, and constitutional theorists have some specific job, and that isn't, you know, the basic character of our society is probably not something that constitutional theorists would be particularly good, at, you know, or that that's within their, you know, within their domain. So I'm not sure that's a problem with constitutional theory. But my more uh, provocative question to you is, so I always get accused of being a pessimist, you know. Every book I come out, people say, oh, you know, it's so discouraging, you just, I'm sorry. I'm thinking your remarks, although you didn't underscore this, make you more of a pessimist than I am. Because <laughs> what you were commenting about our, the current state of our society and everything makes it sound like this is almost hopeless. And, um, and surely no constitutional theorist is going to provide the answer to these deep-seated social problems. Am I right or, uh, or not? Ha- have you beaten me out for you know, the honor of being... So, well, so I, look, I mean, I think on the, on the first point, I take it to be one of the... I mean, one of the exciting parts of Making Men Moral was that it sort of got me to start reading Aristotle more systematically, and this issue of constitution or polity or regime as comprising both institutional questions of the kind that constitutional theorists do talk a lot about, but also more general, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, constitutive questions, we the people kinds of questions um, are involved in the in the classical idea of what of what constitution of what a constitution was thought to be, and yet in in our society, per, perhaps in part because of the because of the liberal orientation, the Rawlsian orientation and influence that has predominated, we uh, we constitutional theorists who are who are always down, we're always late comers, right? We're always uh, following the. The, 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 the real thinkers, the political philosophers, we never think about those things. But I think they are things to think about. They are important features of, of our constitutional law uh, and, and, and issues that constitutional theorists ought to take seriously. So I think that's right down the fairway of the kinds of things that they ought to be thinking about, but just don't for a variety of contingent reasons or perhaps even... Re- Perhaps even it's even the, the fact of fracture that has that has constitutional theorists scurrying away from them. It's like, well, no, I'd, I'd rather just talk about you know sort of uh, you know who the president can fire and hire, right? Uh, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm happier there. But no, I think at a certain point you have to get into uh, the the formative question of we the people. On the on the pessimism point, um, it's always been a, a, a feature of your writing, Steve, that I've greatly admired and tried to model. And so, so if 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 the student has now surpassed the teacher uh, in in pessimism, I tend to think of myself as a as a pretty cheerful guy. Uh, uh, I mean, I I you know um, I like to have a glass of wine or two. That makes me happier, I guess. Every once, in a- but yeah, I, I I am I am a little down, and and that's why I. I'm hopeful, and, and, and that's why I'm stimulated in projects, of course, like mine, but also in projects like Yuval's, to see what can be done, what can be done to reconstruct and rebuild, um, because I don't like being so sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Joel, do you want to pitch in on this? Or? I'll just, I guess I'll just quickly say that um, I, do th- I take Steve's point that... Um, Constitutional theorists might not, it might not be their remit to really think about um, deep questions of character formation. Maybe that, maybe that's true in terms of like division of labor. I'm not certain that's true, but maybe it is. But at the very least, Mark, I think, is right that a relevant consideration in thinking about normative constitutional theory is to what extent does my constitutional theory require the rejection of uh, ideas, concepts that are uh, incorporated into the affective ties that our people have to their constitution. So it's very, it's very common in American constitutional theory for popular sovereignty to just be poo-pooed as just like, you know, simplistic, clearly wrong, um, and not a, a great basis for thinking about the legitimacy of our constitution. 
but popular sovereignty is just widespread as as the idea that the American people have as to why their constitution is legitimate. And it's so important to how they think about themselves in relation to the constitution and their love for their constitution. So to start your, to, as a premise of your constitutional theory, to say, let's just raise all of that to the ground and start from scratch, seems to me to be, at the very least, something that should give you pause as a theorist. Um, and again, I, I, I want to make clear, if popular sovereignty as a theoretical matter is just wrong, it's just not, the, it's just not true, uh, then I'd, I'm not favoring you know, the adoption of a popular theory a popular sovereignty theory mindset or, or, or construct as some sort of noble lie or something like that. Uh, but at the very least, it's, it's a relevant moral consideration to think about the destabilizing effects of trying to advocate or impose a constitutional theory that is at odds with the deepest traditions and effective ties of our people. I didn't call ever popular sovereignty a noble lie, by the way. I think I might have said it's a necessary fiction. Oh, no, I, I wasn't oh, okay. saying... No, no, no. I know you draw that distinction. I, I, I was you saying that, that one, constitutional okay. theorists more generally. No, your, your distinction in your book on lies versus, versus fictions, I think, is very useful. So I have a, a question for, for Steve, actually. Um, because Steve, together with a number of other theorists, has, has, um, uh, has been very convincing to me uh, in speaking about originalism, in, in, in talking about in, intentionalism, intentions originalism. And I wondered if you could reflect um, just briefly on how you see that kind of originalism, which has sort of, you know, sort of uh, gone into, um, well, it's, it's not the favored kind uh, uh, by most theorists today. And yet, to me, I've always felt that that kind of originalism actually is... Um, is most fits most neatly in many ways. That is the the, the view that there is an author of the words, um, uh, and that that author's intentions have to be taken into account. It fits quite neatly and importantly with a natural law view. That is to say, if one were to be uh, an originalist and a natural lawyer, that um, an intentionalist originalism would be the way that one would go. And yet. Um, I think probably there are originalists here in the room, maybe maybe Robbie and, and Joel, who are, I think are originalists, um, who might disagree with that. But, but before we get to them, let's do, do, what do you think about that? Is, is, that the, is an intentionalist originalism a, a, most, a more natural or more, a, a better fit with the natural law view? Well, interesting. So not to go into um, too much detail, a lot of people here may know already about these sorts of debates and so forth. You know, at one time, let's say, with Robert Bork and so forth, uh, when this was kind of beginning in the late 70s, uh, people usually talked about originalism in terms of the Constitution, meaning what the framers intended, and it was sort of an intentionalist version. But over time, that came to be mostly displaced by an original public meaning sort of view that seems to be dominant today, although there are a few intentionalists left, including a couple of colleagues of mine. And... um, and um, and my own view is kind of a hybrid with having to use fictions. To, to do, so, so I won't go into that. People don't want to hear that, I don't think. But, but I would say, I think you're right, that, um, that if you say, if you took the natural law view and said something like, no, other people here will be able to recite it all, but say from Aquinas or something, you know. But part, one of the elements of law is that it's by, promulgated by someone who has the care of the community and so forth. That does seem to me to fit perhaps most easily, with an intentionalist view. And it also fits, I think, most clearly, even without, with the idea that law should be sort of mindful. You know, that, um, and um, now I know that original meaning, public meaning people have some answers to these things, and it would probably get too detailed. I, I don't find all the answers fully convincing, so I think there is something to be said for the idea that uh, it, it should be some kind of reference to an author. You know, the meaning should be determined by reference to some sort of author. And, and I do think that that fits in some ways best with that kind of classical natural opposition. And, and I think that, uh, Steve, to go back to your book again, um, I keep saying his book, Fiction, Lies, and Authority, is the book that I'm referring to from, from Steve. The, in that book, you make this point about this gap that gets introduced between the author of the law mm-hmm. and 
how the law is interpreted and that that gap undermines the effectiveness of that authority. So to the extent that you, that you think there's some sort of moral obligation to uh, sustain the authority of that legitimate lawmaker, you want to track as closely as yeah. possible what they're trying to do and not introduce a gap. And I, do, and I think you make the point in that book that original public meaning could be viewed as introducing just such a gap, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so I think that that is very consonant with the natural law view. Yeah. Um, and I'll just add that, that Richard Eakins's work Right, has there done are a few, lot to, to further few this. Few actually sophisticated yeah, people, right. and it avoids this problem of mindlessness that Vermeil talks about correctly. I think in this respect that um, a case like Bostock raises. I think you know right. if you say uh, if you want law to be mindful, it, in other words, to be the product of actual deliberation, where somebody with authority thinks about some problem, decides what to do about it, and so forth. Then, if you interpret the law to mean something like let's say if it's textual meaning as distinguished from the meaning intended by the lawmaker, it can end up meaning something that nobody would have adopted, you know, and nobody ever really wanted to adopt. And Bostock, I think, is a clear example of that. No no one in the Congress um, intended to have this meaning, and nobody since that time thought it did have this meaning. But if we think really hard about what the words mean, just as Gorsuch says, probably incorrectly even on that level, but you know, if we think really hard about what the words mean, it does have that meaning that nobody intended. So I, I think um, uh, Vermeule says correctly, that just introduces a kind of mindlessness in the law. Now, of course, he did, well, yeah. I, I mean, I like that point because he did actually cite a article I'd written two, <laughs> two decades earlier trying to make that point, but, but he was right. I, I was right, I think, and he, and he was right on that point. And um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's true. Intentionalism has its own problems. Uh, well, just since I suspect, I don't know, Hadley would know what he would say about it. I think Hadley might say something like he said earlier today about, I forget which provision, it was maybe a 14th Amendment provision. You could you should interpret it to mean what it truly means or so forth. Um, not necessarily what the people who adopted it thought it, they wanted it to mean, or even what the public at the time would have thought it meant, but what it really means. I think that creates the same problem of mindlessness, you know, that Bostock that Bostock reveals. But you know, that that's just a, a side point here. Okay. 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 So, so uh, Justice Gorsuch's name was 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 mentioned. So that opens the door for my my, my next question. The most consequential interpreters of the Constitution are the justices on the Supreme Court, at least in my world, they, they are. And so, uh, so I'm wondering, uh, what's your sense of uh, whether the justices um, are thinking this way, wh- wh- whether they are approaching their adjudication of, of the cases with these sorts of principles in mind, or are what we doing right now is just sort of a post hoc explanation or of, of what they're doing and how it fits into some larger scheme. What, what, so, are they interpreting the Constitution along so these I, lines? I think that this is the most theoretically sophisticated court we might ever have had. Or at the very least, there are going to be very few courts in our history that would be as theoretically sophisticated and ambitious as this court. Um, and uh, I think they care very deeply about uh, these basic principles of political morality in thinking through how to approach their task of constitutional adjudication. So I, I, I think you see that in oral argument all the time. Mm-hmm. Where Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, where, where do you see that? Do you see that in the opinions? You, you see it in the right. briefing and in the arguments where uh, advocates uh, all the time now are appealing to deeper principles of constitutional theory that they presumably think mm-hmm. matter in as a matter of good advocacy in getting these justices to care about the views that they are articulating on behalf of their clients. Um, and that, that's just, it's just much more, much more rigorous and systematic theoretically than recent, really, it's hard to think of a, of a court in the 20th century that was uh, as, an early 20th, first century that was as rigorous. In and and is there enough evidence from that that you can characterize what the, what what the framework is that they're the fra- operating? Oh, I, so I've argued that it's broadly originalist. Okay. That I have argued that, uh, for, for in part because of the reason that Steve pointed out, that um, there are, uh, they, originalism as a theory of constitutional adjudication um, does incorporate principles like stare decisis and like party presentation principle that allow for a court to be originalist and yet, in a lot of cases, 
not be applying the original meaning. Mm -hmm. And that can be consistent with originalism as a, as a constitutional theory. And I think that does accurately describe what the court, by and large, is doing. Okay. So I, I agree largely uh, with largely with what uh, Joel just said, with, with one footnote and one qualification. The, the footnote is, I agree on the points about the most uh, theoretical court that we've ever had, I think. Um, but the footnote is, and that includes anti-theoretical theorists, um, like uh, someone like Justice Alito, uh, whose uh, views about theory as such um, aren't um, as far as I can tell, especially, uh, well, um, sort of high theory oriented. But nevertheless, I think if we mean mindful about just what it is that he's doing uh, when he decides cases in a kind of uh, craftsman's way, um, that to me is, is, is a kind of theory, an anti-theoretical theory. That's one thing. And then I just would describe, perhaps, both describe and justify um, what the court is doing, maybe not quite on originalist grounds. There's something else, it seems to me, that's going on that I've been trying to describe in what I've called traditionalism and also justify. Um, you know, it's hard with originalism because it's like three originalists, four originalisms, right? It's, it's a little bit difficult to know what target you're aiming at. Um, but but um, uh, it might be the case that, that some kinds of originalism are consistent with the way that I see uh, and, and, and can justify what the court is doing. Okay. Okay, thanks. Well, with that, unless the panel has further questions for one another, we'll turn it over to the, uh, to the audience. <laughs> Since you called on me, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> now, be, coming back to the conversation I had with our late beloved Nino Scalia, I put, reminded him that Lyman Trumbull had to assure his colleagues up and down that nothing in that 14th Amendment was going to challenge those laws in Illinois as well as Virginia that barred marriage across racial lines. And he knew that if he couldn't get, get, offer them that assurance, that 14th Amendment had no chance of passing. So I asked him, you know, do you mean you should not have taken Loving versus Virginia? He said, let me think of that. Maybe you ought to think about that again. Mm -hmm. No, they're not going to think about that again. Recently, when they did the racial preferences cases on, on, in Harvard, New, they relied on the Equal Protection Clause. Well, we know that the people who framed the intention of those people they didn't, did not think that clause barred racial segregation. Mm -hmm. So we have to ask, what did... What do we know now that they didn't know that? What corrective we do? It's, we're simply asked to explain what the principle was. What we show is that the court never, never did explain what was the deep wrong in principle of, rape, of, of assigning benefits and disabilities based on race. Because if they had, we wouldn't have clever people like Larry Tribe trying to figure out how to get around the decision, right? So well, when you do that, we're asking us to, to explain what do we take finally to be the principle that explains the deep wrongness of it. What is the principle of justice we're bringing forth? Um, whisper, we're doing natural law. And, and it's just, look, if Dick Helmholtz was here from Chicago, he'd say, a summons. What do we get a summons? He says, the natural law. Mm -hmm. What tells us you, ought, if, if you're, you should have a right to be informed that you're going to be indicted for something, prosecuted, in order to prepare your, your, your defense, to get a verdict that is substantially accurate. The judge sees a statute that says we bar racial discrimination in places open to transact, private business open to transaction with public. Do we assume that statute should apply to everyone equally, universally, to everyone who comes under that statute? That's a moral logic. Mm -hmm. Who put it there? Did the Constitution tell us to do that? My point is this. If, if you think that natural law is something, some theory hovering in the sky, you're going to ask like Judge Griffith, when do we invoke it? On the other hand, if you understand it's woven through what we do. I used to say to ask, to ask whether the judge could get through the day without relying on the natural law was like asking the question, can I order the coffee without using syntax? <laughs> it's woven in there yeah. even when you're not aware you're using it. 
And I agree with a lot of that, by the way, but, you know, there are questions where you could talk about. So, you know. Okay, great. Other questions, comments? Um, my question is addressed to all members of the panel who might uh, be interested in uh, giving feedback. Uh, firstly, do you think we can fairly say that the average man on the street, not necessarily consciously, but uh, in practice, is either, say, a legal positivist or looks at the law in some kind of disenchanted way? And um, where do you see opportunities to promote a revival of natural law thinking in the general public? Well, I can't imagine that uh, the general public has, you know, very deep views on jurisprudence, um, which is not to insult them. It's just, to, it's just to say that, you know, that's not part of their day to day lives is to think about the, these questions. So, um, I, I would, I would guess that there have been positivism has been so pervasive in our law, in, in our legal institutions, that my guess is that that would seep into the way people in their everyday lives think about law in some kind of vague way. Um, Here's here's I, I I'm not sure also about the about ordinary citizens, but in my own experience as a teacher, and this gets back a little bit to to Robbie's book, which I'd like to get back to, and that is the 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 issue of legal moralism often comes up in my classes. I teach big big classes, lots and lots and lots and lots of students, hundred at a time, and I like the reach, and um, and the question arises. Um, you know, well, is this a law about morality? And the instinct, like uh, as with Professor Mark earlier, the students are always, they always want to say, no, no, the, the little lie, don't impose your morality on me. And to get them to see that that's what, you've picked the boy, you picked the wrong profession. <laughs> if you don't want to impose your morality, that's what law is, all of it. Every fragment of it is the imposition of a morality, and I, and in that way, I, I've actually come to use again C.S. Lewis's line: "Morality is just it's the rules for running the human machine." Uh, and I use that over and again, and all of a sudden, that's a kind of a it can be a revelation for students. And so maybe that's a way that some of the natural law can filter in, at least in the kind of work. That I that I try to do, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I have something to say. But Reverend Rivers, did you want to come in on? Oh, okay, well, I'll say this. So um, there's been recent work that I think could be uh, helpful in responding to your question about how could we do something that would actually make natural law part of it. So uh, there's a recent book by Stuart Banner about. Uh, and he's a positivist, I'd say, all the way through. But it's a very good historical book about how natural law figured in 18th and 19th century thinking uh, about law. Um, the, uh, you mentioned Dick Helmholtz, another book. There, there's some work along these lines. Um, and it could, it could develop into something. And let me put it this way. I, um, uh, so we, at my school, we have an originalism center, and we have a big constitutional law conference every year on originalism. It's kind of the premier originalism conference. And uh, really good work, good people come there. But I often have the sense that when they're trying to figure out what the original meaning of this provision or that one is, that they are, uh, let's say, handicapped to some degree by the fact that they're understand, trying to understand things in very positivist terms when the people at the time were not understanding law in that way. So, you know, they, they were saying things like, um, well, for example, you know, the case is not the law, it's just evidence of the law. And even about statutes or positive law, sometimes it's sort of evidence of law. And it, seemed, it seems that they had a background sense of law that was more natural law in its, uh, in its nature that's largely been lost. 
And then when we try to figure out what meanings are today and we impose them on that law, but without that background understanding, they don't make sense in one way or another. So I've often thought, I've sometimes thought, that if there were any way forward here, it would be in trying to do a little bit more to recover you know, what the sense of law was at a time when people could talk that way, and then see whether there were ways to use it now. I, I think Hadley Smiley thinks, well, that's what I've been doing my whole life, <laughs> probably, right? Yeah, but, um, but uh, there'd be different ways of doing that, and even when people try to do it today, if they, if they can't recover the original sense of law, it doesn't end up working out right. But, you know, if we could somehow recover that a little bit more, we might actually be able to make some sort of headway. Um, well, I'll just say one more, really quickly. So John Chipman Gray, a Harvard professor from, I don't know, a century ago or something, like to say that um, uh, statutes are not law, they are sources of law. Now, that's sort of an interesting view or something, you know, like the statute is just sort of channeling something, it's providing reasons, but it isn't exactly law in itself probably pros and cons to that view. But if you think about that for a bit, it's already, I think, an entree into a different way of thinking about all these legal sources that we have that could, could be quite fruitful, which, uh, you know, as I mentioned in my little remarks, I hope future generations will do. I'm, I'm soon going to follow a different aspect of Robbie's life and his example by trying to learn to play the banjo. But, you know, <laughs> other people, you know, Joel and Mark, you know, <laughs> younger generations can, can work on this sort of stuff. I think so. Great. Thank you. A lot of people will know I thought a lot about these questions for a long time. And uh, I want to say that any theory of constitutional interpretation that makes grand theory relevant to it is wrong. <laughs> okay? That, that's a good starting point. What I want to do is kind of constrain the discussion or why I, I want to give arguments for why the discussion should be constrained. Uh, you know, grand theories, you know, are, are uh, just not what judges should be doing. They should start with the fact that judges should obey the law. You know, that's the principle of political morality ethics Scalia ultimately relied on for originalism. The judges, like other citizens, have to obey the law, and that means, uh, that means obeying the Constitution and, and the statutes. A, a second step in constraining the discussion is to actually think a little bit more about originalism and judicial review. I mean, a lot of people just conceive of judicial review as this, well, this is existing power, and we're going to decide how we're going to actually exercise it. But where does it come from? You know, the, the first fact you start with is there's nothing in the Constitution that says judges have the power to strike down unconstitutional laws. You know, it's an implication. Now, I think Marshall makes a persuasive case, you know, that it is there by implication. But that argument from implication can only go so far. It can justify, I think, striking down what Hamilton described as manifest violations of the Constitution. And if you start with that, you know, probably about 90% of Judicial review just goes away because 90 percent of judicial review it just doesn't involve manifest violations of the Constitution. Most modern constitutional law is taking phrases, elevating them to a high level of generality, and then saying, "Oh, and judges have the power of judicial review. They're supposed to fill in these majestic generalities." And now there, there's all kinds of, as, as Steve would say. Now, uh, there are all kinds of arguments within these constraints. There's gray areas of, about, you know, lots of different things. But if you actually accepted those principles, that judges have to obey the law, and second, that judicial review is a relatively limited power to enforce the clear meaning of the Constitution and to strike down clear violations of it, most judicial review goes away. Not all of it. And there's still gray areas that are tough, but it's a different world, you know? And I have to say, after, you know, 50 years of studying con law, as I hear all the arguments about, you know, the grand theories of judicial review, I just want to go, 
Oh, yeah, that one again. <laughs> the same, you know, the arguments just keep coming back all the time, and it's the, the same old arguments and just as implausible now as they used to be. But, Chris, anybody who works in any field for 50 years, I suspect, will say the same thing about all the new work in that field. <laughs> so, and they might be right some of the time. Uh, okay, thanks. Other questions? Yeah, thank you. Let me take the audience back to a special pleasure that I had, I guess, 11 months ago, huddled over my computer with a copy of Making Men Moral as the first Zoom class in my final semester at Scalia Law was to begin. After three and a half years of admittedly probably the best that you know, right of, a right of center law student could have hoped for with a faculty, I was still being whacked over the head with the assumptions of positivism, and finally, the breath of fresh air to have Professor George starting us with an opening lecture eviscerating Justice Holmes's position that he articulated in The Path of the Law in 1897, which only seems to have been embedded even further in our law. But to see Robbie just so artfully take it down, it was invigorating for a law student because it was a whole nother lens through which to view everything that we had been learning up until that point and the strongest possible challenge. This is at the heart, this, this, I think, battle to refute Holmes, this battle is at the heart of the future of the conservative legal movement. I would be eager to hear the panel's thoughts on how much Holmes's positivism is embedded within the modern originalist project because we heard, Hadley and I worked together for 10 years now, we, we've, we've heard from judges who will tell us that what he and Robbie George are arguing is not that originalism is the fruit of a, some kind of poison tree, but that originalism in a post-Holmes world has a self-defeating quality to it that Jerry Bradley, among others, has revealed that in the most penetrating and um, uh, uh, you know, decisive ways in the cases that shape our culture undermines the very claims that we're making. I'd also like to hear from the panel the question of whether this view of originalism has also embedded in it an understanding of judicial supremacy that Chris also brought up, because I think it's important to recognize that any kind of claims about the role of natural law and constitutionalism only constitute ascertaining what is the principle at play in a case between these two litigants. Robbie has been at the forefront of uh, countering judicial supremacy in his public life as well as his academic life. But I think just like Holmes's positivism is embedded, we have this false notion of judicial supremacy that also pervades our law. And I'm hoping that as a matter of you know, concern among the panelists, we can address how that is something that we as you know, civic leaders and, and, and sometimes thought leaders, I hate that term, but for lack of any better one, how we can reteach and reestablish that the court is not um, right because it's final, but it's only final when it's right. So, okay, we have two minutes to do that. Take it on. Yeah, so given the time constraints, I'll just address the first question and say that uh, I've been very critical of uh, early originalist theories for being uh, very positivist in their conception of law. I think this was true even of uh, originalists who disclaimed positivism like Justice Scalia and, and Judge Bork. I think both of them, in their uh, approaches to law, manifested a sort of po legal positivism that uh, contradicted their own views on the nature of law when they were not talking about originalism. I've been very critical of that. I think a lot of the natural law non-originalists, like critics of originalism, have tended to uh, take those more positivist theories of originalism as just what originalism is, like definitionally, and attacked that and wholly ignored uh, the natural law theories justifying originalism by people like me and Kevin Walsh, and Jeff Pojanowski, and Lee Strang, uh, and tended to just essentially attack straw men 
as as saying, well, only those who uh, the only way you can be an originalist is to be a positivist. Well, that's only true if you just don't pay close attention to any of the arguments being made by natural law theorists who are originalists. Okay. That's not good. Oh well, we end it. Yeah, I mean, it's such a it's a very important question, yeah. but such a big one that I'm not sure I should try okay. to take it on. So. Well, I think I think the time is up, and uh, thank the panelists for your <laughs> contributions. Thank you.